I've managed to get hold of a bike with a brand new Fox Float X2 rear shock. It's just about the most complicated shock I've ever had. So unfortunately I have no idea how to set it up. So I've come here to South Wales to suspension tuning experts Mojo to see if they can help out. A recommended setting will only ever be an average. Um, I can see you're riding flat um, and I know you're riding the Surrey Hills. You're going to spend a lot of time protecting that front end. We need to, we need to think about that balance in the setup. It's not just a simple case of putting in the recommended settings and expecting that to give you the perfect balance for wherever you ride. Um, I need to make these clickers respond to your legs in the way that makes the ride engaging for you. We need to keep the ride height for pedaling high because that's where it's going to pedal better. Um, if we drop you any further back it'll just feel like purgatory on the climbs. What, what's going to be important is uh, try and drop you further into the travel lower into the stroke. I mean progression is uh, a big part of trying to make a bike poppy and you're a flats rider you're going to use your energy um, to get this bike to respond. You can't just do a dirty SPD pull up. You're going to need a little bit of pop back from the bike. So let's try ramping it up a bit more, a bit more volume spaces. Okay. So uh, we've already taken the air out, we just take the air sleeve off. The older versions sometimes don't have this grub screw holding them in, okay. um, but as long as they've got this 250 PSI Max sticker on, they've had the recall. Okay. Um, and just so you literally, just, you, you just turn it's, and there's, a, there's a little key in here that slots into slots in and then stops the air sleeve coming off. You just rotate it to the stop, push it off. And uh, uh, so we've got a situation where um, uh, James already jammed it full. We're probably gonna have to just take out that spacer limiter. This acts as a volume spacer in itself, but it's wider than a normal volume spacer. So it stops customers from putting too much in. Um, so there's, there's a maximum number of spaces you're allowed, but that's based on this maximum pressure. And it's, you know, if you were 90 kilos and you were riding um, downhill courses um, and you're already at the maximum everywhere else, that might be an issue, but um, uh, you're well down on pressure, nowhere near the maximum. So the closing pressure isn't going to be anywhere that's going to be dangerous. Okay. So now we'd have to go back and set the air spring because um, we now change the progression. So we'll probably end up with very slightly different pressure in there. When we're putting air into the Flow X2 shock, there's a very large negative volume um, and we've got it in the stand, so there's weight on the rear wheel. It will basically only be filling the positive chamber, okay. so we'll need to go through and rebalance to get the positive and the negative okay. chambers balanced as we go through until we get to the correct pressure. I normally do it just by um, dropping the bike off the stand and pushing the bike into its travel. Uh, a very small amount. It's normally uh, it's about seven to ten millimeters into the travel, and if you, um, I, what I normally do is just put my chest on the saddle and pull this, so you can be really controlled. And, and then if you do the same as I did, but just have a feel, just really gently. Did you feel it then? Yeah, I felt like it. Yeah. And that's, um, that just means that you've got um, pressure in the negative and there's, there's actually, you know, it's actually really initial. The initial touch is really nice. Uh, whereas if it wasn't balanced properly, it wouldn't be. In terms of the clicker settings, I tend to think of the compression as the icing on the cake. If I don't need to use it, I won't use it. I always count from fully closed and most bikes in the sort of medium travel segment are going to be on the sort of 
14 to 17 clicks from fully closed on the high speed. So it's pretty close to full open, yeah. but that's where it works well. So the fork setting was pretty good for Jamie from the start, but seeing as he's a journalist and uh, the bike lives in the garage sometimes, we're just going to check on the volume spacer settings to make sure that he can go back to that and yeah. correct number of volume spaces if somebody borrows it and changes them. So it's a pretty simple job. All we need to do is take out the pressure and then just unscrew the top cap. Um, the, the lip on the top cap is not very high, so make sure you've got a completely flat socket um, so that you're not going to eat up the, eat up the corners. Okay. That's good and tight. And the volume spacers simply clip on. Um, super easy system, just like little Lego blocks. So you literally just pop them, um, pop them on and off like that. Just literally just push, push off. You're on two spacers. It's uh, that's quite normal. You're not on a. It's, it's it's not massively progressive with lots of spacers. It's not massively linear with no spacers. So. But uh, if you can uh, remember, remember that, then, yeah. you can always get yeah. scribble it down somewhere and you can always get back to the setting that you liked. I'd normally yes. go for sort of 25 to 30 percent sag. Okay. Aggressive riders will want probably more like 20 to 25 percent because they'll want that support. Yeah. Measure that sag while the rider's in the attack position. Um, so as if you're about to drop into a, an interesting section and someone can hold the bike for you, lift the front end and push the front end just to check it's not got too much stiction. It might mean that you're riding so much more confidently that you might need more pressure and more spaces in the rear. I've seen that, you know, in, in a situation where the rider's not confident of the bike and it might be a front end or a rear end thing. But as you get more and more confident in the bike, you start to hit it with more force and feel like you're safe on it. So all of a sudden everything can go up. Um, so the setting has to respond to the rider and the, you know, the setup. The same as the rear shock or any other fork, the, the in, in terms of importance, the steps are, first of all, pressure for ride height. The pressure gives you the support. The volume spaces give you the ramp up at the end of the travel. Okay. So for here, it's pressure for here is volume spaces. So first of all, we set the pressure, um, then we ride, yep. and then we set the volume spaces based on how much travel you're using. You can kind of do most of that in the car park, to be fair. Then we set the rebound to the correct amount of pop that the rider wants. You'll watch a rider to get that. What I normally say if people want a, a sort of baseline setting is that I normally get the rider to roll through the car park, push the bike both ends as hard as possible and then instead of trying to absorb that as if trying to absorb the movement on a trampoline, keep arms and legs stiff when they reach the bottom and just watch what the shock and fork are doing. And what you should be doing is recovering past the sag point and settling into the sag point. If you get a full oscillation, it's too fast normally. Um, if you don't get any oscillation and just recovers to the sag point, then that's probably too slow. Another thing to bear in mind is that um, riding trail centres and riding slow and riding wet in the UK, we tend to overdo the rebound because it feels kind of comforting. And then you get to the Alps or on your two weeks holiday, pay for your two weeks holiday and spend two weeks in misery with arm pump just because your rebound setting was good for the mud at home. Make it, make it faster. It needs to be quicker. You need that recovery, especially on the front end. So if we're setting the rebound, I'd still use the same, uh, uh, the same protocol. You go fully clockwise first, because that's where all the tolerance stack is taken up and the meter rod meets the piston. So it will always be the same, whichever version of this fork you're running and then count backwards from there. And most of the Fit4 forks from Fox respond well, somewhere between six and nine clicks. And the RC2 cartridges tend to work well, 
sort of 12 to 16 clicks from fully closed. On this side of the fort, we've got an adjuster that firms up the compression to hold the front end up for climbing. Why anyone would ever want to do that, I, I don't know. Why would you want the front end to be higher for climbing? Seems, seems like a dumb idea to me. So don't use that. And then we've got a low speed compression adjuster in the middle. Um, similar idea to the rear, to the rear shock. If you don't need low speed compression to load one end of the bike or the other, then don't use it. Um, I would only use it if we were struggling to get that to use travel and this is using too much travel, but the ride height and the handling everywhere else is good, then, and we couldn't do it with air pressure or volume spaces, then I would wind some low speed compression on. And that will pretty efficiently load the rear wheel um, in low speed situations in turns more than the front. So experiment with it, okay. you know, find yourself a turn, think about what's happening, put compression on the rear and then take it off, put compression on the front, take it off, same turn, just keep riding it and you'll see what I mean, it's really simple to see. Okay. You'll think, I made a mistake there, no you didn't make a mistake you were riding a bike that was set up badly. You know, Rossi doesn't come in from the MotoGP practice and go, I'm riding really badly, lads. It's probably just me. Mm -hmm. No, he comes in and he wants, he wants the bike to match his riding. And we're nowhere near Valentino Rossi's skill, but we're not gonna change. We've been riding for 20 years. We're not suddenly gonna learn how to ride this bike. The bike needs to match us. That's what the adjustments are for. So. And I, when I'm doing a setup, I normally, you know, I can see when a rider's comfortable on the bike, if he's scared of the front end, or if he's uh, loving that grip from the front end, if he's got that sort of dynamic pop. You can see if a rider's feeling confident in the bike just from the playfulness. Um, but it's, yeah, mostly about watching the rider at that level. You can only get so much from the, from the manual and from the, from the cheat sheets.